know, today's a, a special day. We have our church picnic, but we also have some baptisms. So if there's something that we do here that's so important today is the baptisms. And um, baptisms, uh, as some of us, we have visitors who are here to witness that, and we're going to be doing, doing them later. And we want to bless you as our guests, and we're going to have a, a good meal, delicious meal. And after that, we're going to be doing our baptisms so we're excited you're here. So let's open with prayer. You can stay seated. And I'm just going to invite you to have your own prayer with God. And I'm going to open up like this. So with just eyes closed in reverence of our Lord Jesus Christ and heads bowed, my prayer goes like this. And I'm asking from your mind's eye to the ear of Jesus Christ to say your own prayer. So Heavenly Father, I stand before you, Lord. I ask that you wash me, Lord with the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Calvary. Lord, you've died for my sins. I'm a sinner. Lord, I come before you, Lord, and I ask that as you wash me, that your words fill me, and I'm able to express and teach, Lord, and um, to honor my God. So, Lord, as we come before you, each, every man and woman, uh, they stand in their own accountants to you, Lord, so that they could take this time and and bring peace, bring forgiveness, bring the blood of Christ, Lord, in their lives. So if you just take a second, and we're just going to take a moment for you to have that prayer to God. There's so many needs and so many different reasons we come to church. But the most important thing is we come to, to be equipped and to learn about the Word of God. So as we, we have this message, I'm going to tell you where I'm preaching from here. Uh, I'm in John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. And I'll lay this out for you a little bit. John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. Um, this is Jesus Christ. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit last week about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And this is a, a religious group, and they're, they're, they're not all bad, but these are men and, uh, who've learned about the Torah, the first five books of, of, the, of the Word of God, and they're educated and highly educated, but they're very religious and to the point of they, they forget to combine the love of Jesus Christ, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to their agenda. So they're, they're pretty judgmental. And they really feel like, unless it's written here in the law, and they forgot about the grace, and they forgot about the forgiveness. So this story is about grace and forgiveness, and it, it's a neat story as we go through this. But it makes sense today, because today we're doing baptisms, and baptisms is, is about what? It's an inward change. There becomes an inward change in you that you start actually comprehending and understanding the Word of God and there becomes an inward change. And because there's an inward change, we do this outward expression and we surrender and we get baptized. But we get baptized in front of a lot of people because it's not just for the person being baptized. It's for the unbelievers as well. Why are they doing it? Why are they crazy? Why is this church crazy? Right. So first of all, I admit we're crazy. OK, so let's get that out of the check that box. But we're crazy for Christ. We're crazy for the word of God. We're crazy for the truth. And the time we get baptized, there's, there's uh, a line written in the sand. There's a line that's written in the sand that we say, and we say, Lord, I'm standing on this line. I'm believing in the word of God. I'm going to be loving you, selling out for you, Lord. And there's an inward change. And because there's an inward change, there's an outward expression of surrender. And that surrender looks like as we go underwater, and we get submerged, it's symbolic of being submerged in the death of Jesus Christ. And we come up, it's, it's symbolic of the resurrection that Jesus Christ, three days later, he's resurrected from the tomb. We serve a living God. And if we understand that we serve a living God, there's a change. And there's this change where we say, Lord, I'm, I'm surrendering. I'm showing people who I belong to. I'm submitting, Lord, and here I am. And that's what's happening today. And that's an incredible thing that we are able to witness. Um, so, again, we're, we're glad that you can witness. And this is a refresher to understand 
what it's about and if you've been baptized and, and you've seen that and you said, you know, I have to remember that day again because that's the day I drew a line in the sand and I knew who I was going to stand for and how I'm going to stand for him and how I'm going to submit to him because as Christians we come across and we start learning the word of God. But you know what? There's a line written in the sand. And God, it's, it's in the word of God. And he says, if you're a believer, you're going to stand on this side. And you're going to stand for these things. And guess what? You're going to get persecuted and people might, may not like you at times. But you're going to stand for his holiness, for his sanctification. And you know, Lord, I'm sold out to you. And because I'm sold out to you and the spirit of God lives in me, I'm submitted to your will, not my own, but your will. And what does that look like? It's a surrender. See, baptism is a surrender of my will, and I'm going to go to your will, Lord. Your will is more important than my agenda. So, again, if you can remember the day you were baptized, the day that you made that commitment, sometimes we need to be reminded, really, why we did it and who we serve. But that day, there was a line written in the sand. And that was a line written by Jesus Christ and saying, when you stand for me, you're going to stand for these things. And you may not be the most popular person in the room, but you're going to stand for something. But you know, folks, we all stand for something. Even the world who don't surrender to God, they stand for something. And even if it's loss and unrighteousness, they stand for something. But if we line our will and we line our will up to his word, that's what we need to stand for. We need to stand for his sanctification. He makes a difference. And when we start lining our life up with his word, we start standing in his word, we start surrendering in his word, we don't compromise in his word, guess what happens? There's this inward change. There's an incredible surrender that happens. And today, we need to remember that as we see these folks get baptized. What is this about, Lord? It's not about my will. It's not about my agenda, but it's about your agenda. It's about your will. It's about re remembering that surrender. Because even in church, things can get funky. Because you're dealing with people. Well, I don't like this person. I don't like, they're not friendly enough. They didn't shake my hand tight enough. Matter of fact, they didn't shake my hand. And we start bringing up our, our, our flesh, our attitude, because we're just different people. But we have to remember, it's not about you. It's always always been about him and we'll remember that our submission to him makes that difference because i belong to him i surrender to him and that's what baptism there's an inward change and i'm going to have this outward expression of surrender for not just for me for my family and friends and uncle george and uncle pete over there and aunt nelly saying hey he's crazy he drank the juice and you know what it's okay the juice belongs to Jesus Christ. The surrender belongs to Jesus Christ. So as we, we go forward, I'm going to read this story to you. So I'm preaching from John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law, here the, comes these, this group of people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees brought in a woman caught in adultery. So obviously this woman, uh, she was a pro the town prostitute. We talked about a different story last week. <clears throat> and they wanted to embarrass her. So they, they bring her in front of all these people. And they point out that she's a town prostitute. But this whole story, it, it's a setup. Because the Sadducees and the Pharisees wanted to set up Jesus Christ. They, they weren't trying to compliment him. They weren't even trying to be challenged. They were trying to set Jesus Christ up. Okay, so it goes a little further. Verse 4, and Jesus, <clears throat> they said, well, I'm going to go back to 3. The teachers of the law, the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And then they turn around, and this is kind of how snake of their being, they, they go back to the word of God, and they're trying to catch him on something, and they turn around to verse 5, and it says, in the law of Moses, and we've heard of Moses, 
And he's one of the one of these great matriarchs who, who, who went and uh, put down the trail for everyone to follow. Moses, commander, commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say we should do? See, so they're saying, hey, she's a prostitute. She's caught in adultery. You know, we should we should stone them. Don't you think? It goes on. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for, for accusing him. So they're setting him up. So you're understanding the story. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So Jesus, he's, he's scribbling in the sand and everybody's watching him. What is he doing? And remember, they're trying to set him up. Verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any of you without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. So he brings an invitation and he says, and this applies to each and every one of us today, if you're guiltless, if you haven't sinned, if, if you've never let the word of God flow and breaking the word of God, he says, hey, if you're without guilt, if, if you're blameless, he goes, grab a stone and be the first to stone this woman. Verse 9, at this, those who heard began to go away. So Jesus put a line in the sand, and he starts scribbling it down, and a lot of historians say it, it meant a lot of different things, and it was, we don't have accurate proof of what it's written down, but he's writing something in the sand, and he's challenging them. And he says, if you're without sin, throw the first stone. And then, verse 9, that those who heard, they began to walk away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, and the woman still standing there. So, if you can imagine somebody coming up and being so embarrassed and saying, Hey, I got caught in this act of adultery, and they're trying to make a show of her, a display of her, not in a good way. Now, I want to bring something back to you. We had uh, Matt Van Sickle, I can say this because he said it personally, he said he had an extramarital affair and he came and he asked forgiveness. He didn't have to share that personal information to this body at all, but he did it because God forgave him, God renewed him, God disciplined him, and God restored him. We have no, any of us who are judging any, because I've heard some, because I've heard some, but if any of us are judging, then shame on you. Because this story would apply to you. This story would fit you. That's the Sadducee and Pharisee. And Jesus says, stop that. Nonsense. Pick up the first stone. Because we're all sinners. But a man who came up and his wife giving him permission and his kids there say, hey, this is what happened. And I felt short of God. And I've asked for forgiveness. I, I, just, I salute that. And I appreciate that I have a man of God who can stand for that. God's righteousness, God's grace, God's forgiveness. That's what this story is about. And we start seeing that. That's what Christianity is about. We're not perfect. But we serve a God who is perfect. And we serve a God who can forgive us, a God who will restore us and get us back on track because he died for our sins, but he wants us all to be able to be in heaven. Because at the end of the day, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And we'll end up here or over there. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. There's a door A and there's a door B. I suggest you stick with A. But we have a choice. And he's given us a choice. And that's what I love about God, because he's given us a choice. And that's a beautiful thing, that our God has given us a choice. So I want to be able to show forgiveness I wanted to show grace like God has. And this is a beautiful story of our Lord and Savior showing grace and forgiveness. So it says, I'm going to read again, verse 10, Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Because everybody had left. He said, where are they? Everybody vacated. And he says, has no one condemned you? Because nobody is without sin. And then he says, neither do I condemn you. And Jesus declared, go now. So listen to his 
Jesus' restitution to her. It wasn't say, oh, it's all good. Go keep doing what you're doing. He said, go now, he says, and he forgives her, number one. He declared, go, and he says, leave your sin. He didn't say, go back and continue what you're doing. He wanted her to be renewed in his spirit and change her program. That's what God does to us. God wants us to be renewed in his spirit and change our program. That's why we come out and, and one of the biggest things of the family picnic is, uh, for me, it's the food. But then after that, I'm kidding. Uh, it's, it's being able to gather as a family. It's being able and to. So today, I want to challenge you as you're eating, um, say hi to somebody you don't know. Uh, welcome somebody and, and let them know we're, it's a privilege having them here. But you know what's so powerful about the Word of God? The Word says it doesn't leave void. So there's a lot of listeners right now hearing it. And I want to challenge you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know, talk to someone. We'll be hanging around if you're wanting to learn more. But don't just let status quo stay status quo. God's got a plan for your life. God has an invitation for your life. But you got a choice. He gives you a choice. And that choice has to be, Lord, I choose you. And if you only got a hold of religion, you're still pretty lost. As you can see, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they had a hold of religion, but they didn't have a hold of God's grace and God's forgiveness. They didn't understand the program. It wasn't a religious program. And pretty soon we start learning this. And the moral to this story is there's a line written in the sand. There's a line that's drawn. And that line on one side is grace and forgiveness and the hope and belief of Jesus Christ. The surrender of my will to his will, that's what this program is. And as we, we learn that and we surrender to that, God has a plan for your eternity. Not just now, but for your eternity. And that's a big deal. The eternity is a big deal. That's forever after. When I take my last breath and I begin my new journey with Christ, that's forever. Well, don't screw up forever. That's my advice to you. Don't screw up forever it won't be fun but the line is written in the sand to make a choice we live for him we sell out for him we don't compromise and guess what as the world transgresses your job becomes more brutal because now we're we're, we're the freaks and how do you believe that how do you stand for those things but we do it in love we do it in love so, before I conclude, I'm going to ask my friend Brianne to come up. Brianne, why don't you come on up? I asked, uh, Brianne's getting baptized today. I asked if he would give a brief testimony. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brianne, obviously. Um, Rob makes this look really, really easy. <laughs> he, does, he really does. Um, but uh, this was possibly my last Sunday with you guys, so it's a little bit bittersweet. Um, but I did write down my uh, testimony for you guys, so it won't be long, but um, I'm going to share what I, what I wrote down. Um, for, I already introduced myself. My name is Brian Holly. I'm honored to share my baptism testimony with you today. Uh, this is a little bit about my background. I grew up in Peoria, Illinois. I was raised with a religious upbringing and a lack of thereof. For a long time, I, felt, I had feelings of uh, emptiness and curiosity about my faith and who Jesus actually is. But my real journey actually started when I was 23 years old. I was completely tired of myself, thoughts and actions. Uh, the more I read my Bible, the more I felt safe and, and at peace. I began to go to church and hung out with fellow believers. Uh, my turning point for me was when uh, I had a couple of serious setbacks. Uh, when I say serious setbacks, I mean um, going to jail for a really long time, um, dealing with depression, uh, suicidal thoughts, all that type of stuff. Um, and then realizing that I couldn't, I couldn't live life without Christ. I couldn't do it by myself because I tried multiple, multiple times and I always, I always fail. It just doesn't work. Um, it, was, it was during that time where I felt feelings of peace, understanding, and a connection with God. Um, I decided to get baptized today because I want to publicly declare my faith and follow Jesus' example. Baptism for me symbolizes the new beginning and commitment to, to follow Christ. And before I, before I uh, close, um, if you're battling with any depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal thoughts, please reach out to, to your loved ones. 
because I know that's something that I, I dealt with before I got up here. That's the reason why I'm up here now and everything, because I almost took my, took my own life. And Rhonda and Rob has opened their doors to me and has been training me and teaching me different things and everything like that. And to learn how to pray again, learn how to trust in God again, and to actually depend on people because I always try to do things by myself. So if you, if you are dealing with any, any type of thing, any mental health things, please reach out to your neighbors or like I said, your loved ones or your church members and stuff like that. So they can pray for you and, you know, check up on you and everything because it's, it's lonely. It can get really lonely and we get comfortable and everything like that. And we're stuck in our own thoughts and it's, it sucks. It really does. So if you are, please reach out, please reach out. Um, so I'm going to close with this. I am grateful for this opportunity to share my testimony with you all here today. Uh, thank you for being a part of this special moment in my life. I really do appreciate you guys. You guys have been been very, very welcome. I did not expect that coming here for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, you guys have definitely shocked me. And I, I feel like this is home. This is my second home. And I do really appreciate all of you guys. I appreciate it all. Thank you. So uh, a couple things I want to say with this is, uh, first of all, as you can see, Brianne's a black man. <laughs> like, oh. It's okay. And here's the neat thing, you know, we're, he's, you know, he's, he's my, my brother from a different mother, but we have the same father, Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's a beautiful thing. And a compliment to this community was, he goes, you know what, small community, you, you sometimes, and remember, I'm, I'm out of the box, and my wife scolds me when I, when I say crazy things. So, but, you know, you still can have prejudice. You can still have things like that. And he said, you know, I've come here. I never got that vibe from anyone. They've made me, Ogden, Water's Edge, made me feel nothing but comfortable and accepted. That's a compliment to your character and to the community. So I, I want you to know that. That's important, and that's important. And uh, about uh, being a, a Christian for Christ, um, we invited him into our home because he's, he's our family. We've invited strangers into our home because they're our family. And being a Christian, um, sometimes it's inconvenience. Sometimes it's inconvenience. And sometimes it can be uncomfortable. But you know what? That's what we're teaching as being uh, God is the perfect example. And we want to be in his image. And we want to sometimes be uncomfortable. And so please remember those things. Uh, it's not about religion. It's about, do I have a heaven relationship with Christ? And am I showing people the love of Jesus Christ? I'm going to conclude with this. First, the word grace appears 185 times in the Bible. Grace. The first time grace appears in the Bible is as Genesis 6, 8. And it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. So that's the beginning of the Bible, beginning. And he says, see, we know millions and millions of people drowned and died from Noah's Ark because they wouldn't repent and they wouldn't accept Christ and they wouldn't repent. When they had the Ark, it wasn't just for animals. It was made and they planned to bring people but they rejected Christ. So I, I want to say this. If some of us are here visiting and say, well, I'm not worried. That's your deal. That's religion. He let millions of people drown to death and die and not go to heaven. So he, he gives us a choice. And there's a surrender that can come only from you. Only from you surrendering to him. But from the beginning of the Bible, God had a plan. And the plan that all would repent and be saved. And that they would know him. And for the beginning of Genesis. Now, this is really cool. Revelations 22, 21. It's the last time grace appears in the Bible. And it says, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So Jesus is signing out. He's closing the chapter. And he says, grace. Let my grace be birthed in you. Let my grace abound in you. Let, let a person like Matt Van Sickle who's brave enough and give his testimony and then we're, we're not there to judge him. That's God's job. We, we need to love him. 
And we need to know that he found Christ and was restored. And we need to accept that, receive it, and say, you know what? I'm going to show grace like Christ. I'm going to love like God. So, folks, uh, we don't want it to become religious. We want to have the spirit and the heart of Christ. So when your brother calls you, like Brianna, and says, hey, I'm going through a tough time, Ron and I said, of course, our home's your home. Come over. Stay as long as you want. It doesn't matter because you're my brother in Christ. That's real. So when the line is drawn in the sand, know what you stand for. Know who you stand for. Know that you're surrendering to the mighty God that you may not, you may want to not deny him or, or receive him and you're denying him. But the bottom line, when you take your last breath, you will stand before him and will be accountable for everything. But God's grace says, I will forgive you. I will redeem you. I will restore you. And I'll blot out your sins and you can be with me in eternity. That's important. That's everything. And I want to encourage you, tell somebody. Tell somebody about God's grace. Invite someone to church. Get out of your comfort zone. Because, folks, there's a lot of people lost and, and going to hell. And that should bother us. That should bother us. That should make us uncomfortable. And it should help us to be brave to do the right thing. So let's stand up and let's worship together. Thank you for being here.